welcome to this next session that is recurrent abortions now by definition what are recurrent pregnancy loss or recurrent abortions if any patient has three or more spontaneous abortions before 20 weeks we call it as recurrent pregnancy loss or recurrent abortion these abortions may not be consecutive but still they are included in the definition you may advise set of investigation to a patient if she has two abortions maybe first trimester or second trimester we need not wait for third abortion to take place we can start investigation getting her even after two abortions so what are the common causes in which clinical conditions the patient faces recurrent abortions in first trimester most common cause is genetic again and the most desired investigation in recurrent pregnancy loss is karyotyping of both the parents please remember guys the most indicated investigation in recurrent first trimester abortion is karyotyping of both the parents and the most unwanted investigation which unfortunately done most commonly is torch torch titers are not indicated in recurrent pregnancy losses we will come to this point again in detail that why i am saying so now what is the etiology for recurrent pregnancy losses first trimester again the genetic cause is most common endocrine causes like luteal phase defect diabetes and all those things which we have seen immunological causes can cause recurrent first trimester as well as second trimester abortions infections may cause second trimester abortions but infections we are not talking about torch infections here let me make this point very clear inherited thrombophilias and unexplained causes second trimester mainly anatomical causes like congenital anomalies again septate bicornuate unicornuate uterus cervical incompetence intrauterine adhesions uterine fibroids that will lead to recurrent pregnancy losses maternal medical illnesses again metabolic disorders chronic renal diseases hypertension or other chronic diseases can also be contributory factors immunological causes both first trimester second trimester recurrent losses rh isoimmunization usually second trimester and unexplained in both the things now points to remember very important things most common cause genetic factor but last time when we saw isolated abortion the most common genetic abnormality for isolated abortion was trisomy and that also trisomy 16 now mind well that most common genetic abnormality in recurrent pregnancy losses is balanced translocation please mind this point very well that trisomies cannot be in all pregnancies like one pregnancy trisomy aborted second will again have trisomy again will get aborted third will again have trisomy this will not happen but if any of the parents would have balanced translocation means some genetic material is lost from the chromosomes but it's not lost completely it is balanced translocated from one chromosome to another but when a conceptus is formed that can have unbalanced translocation and thus that conceptus will not survive and will get aborted so parents they do look normal they don't have any genetic abnormality as such you have to do karyotyping in cases where you find that patient is aborting successively or consecutively or three or more times in early first trimester so remember balanced translocation is the most common genetic abnormality leading to first trimester recurrent pregnancy losses and the investigation of choice is karyotyping of both the parents most common cause in second trimester for rpl is cervical incompetence the cervix is incompetent after certain gestational period the os just opens up and the pregnancy gets aborted torch infections which includes toxoplasmosis rubella hepatitis cmv viruses usually understand that suppose a patient gets infected with any of these there is formation of immunity at that particular place or in that particular patient so how once she gets the immunity how next time again if she 
gets that infection immunity has already there in her body so it's not going to cause recurrent abortion so please understand torch titers which caused a huge amount to the patient is not indicated in cases of recurrent pregnancy losses it's the most unwanted investigation for recurrent pregnancy losses it can cause isolated abortion but then patient will have immunity against that particular disorder next time the cause may be different i hope that you get this point very straight now what investigations we should do if we have patient of recurrent pregnancy loss as i said parental karyotyping then the hemogram then we should go for hormones to rule out hypothyroidism hyperthyroidism tsh would tell us prolactin then anticardiolipin and lupus anticoagulant these are the factors which i am talking about immunological causes where anti phospholipid antibody uh, syndrome comes in if required we can also investigate the couple for inherited thrombophilias anti phospholipid antibody acquired thrombophilia inherited thrombophilia is another screen where we have deficiencies like protein c protein s factor 5 leiden mutation prothrombin gene mutation homocystinemia antithrombin levels we need to check so this is a completely different package to see whether that patient has inherited thrombophilias and other causes for uterine anomalies we can have investigations like hysterosalpingography or hysteroscopy now let's see what is this anti phospholipid antibody syndrome in detail it's a autoimmune disorder and it is associated with recurrent pregnancy losses it is treatable what happens what goes wrong there is formation of antibodies against our own anti uh, against our own phospholipids the antibodies can be igg igm or iga most common phospholipids which are found they are either lupus anticoagulant or anti cardiolipin antibody formation or biological false positive syphilis test these are procoagulants means they enhance intravascular coagulation which leads to either arterial or venous thrombosis venous is more common than arterial these thrombi they go and obliterate the placental circulation and then that will lead to recurrent pregnancy losses or pih because defective placentation is one of the theories put forth for pregnancy induced hypertension it may lead to iugr because there is placental insufficiency it may lead to iud abruption so because of these thrombi formation these this is the spectrum of diseases which we may see in that particular patient most common most important is lupus anticoagulant it is seen in sle patients or the patient can be completely asymptomatic if you investigate the patient what you find prolonged ptt it's a basically name is anticoagulant but it's a misnomer it's basically a procoagulant which leads to thrombosis so diagnostic tests are prothrombin time would be normal prothrombin aptt that is activated partial thromboplastin time will be prolonged keolin time would be prolonged and the diagnosis which is based on this important investigation that is russell viper venome time that would be prolonged so if you have to conclude that your patient has lupus you have to have these investigations that pt is normal aptt prolonged and russell viper venome time is prolonged there will also be presence of increased anti beta 2 glycoprotein antibodies and decreased platelets decreased platelets is because of this formation of thrombi where utilization of platelets takes place so there is thrombocytopenia or even hemolytic anemia would be there but there is never neutrophil count will always remain normal i'll come to this point once again the other important anti phospholipid is anti cardiolipin antibodies it's most commonly seen in early rpl than in late again we have igg igm iga levels if igg levels are more than 20 units it's considered as positive but to say that that particular patient has anti phospholipid antibody syndrome we should have two positive test 6 weeks apart and please remember in non pregnant state if the patient is pregnant and then we do this test and they come positive we cannot say that she has anti phospholipid antibody 
they have to the investigation has to be done in between two pregnancies six weeks apart twice the test should show more levels of antibodies then only we can say that yes she has antiphospholipid antibody syndrome the treatment there are drugs of choice is low dose aspirin and the other one is low molecular weight heparin we can start aspirin safely in a patient preconceptionally 75 or 81 mg the ideal dose low dose aspirin every day throughout the conception we can also start low molecular weight heparin once the pregnancy is confirmed until term we can continue then when she is likely to go in labor we stop the drug again postpartum period we again shift her on low molecular weight heparin because that is the period where she is more likely to have thrombus formation in women with history of thrombosis suppose she has history of one thrombotic evidence before and she is on warfarin then we are supposed to stop warfarin when she is likely to conceive because warfarin has teratogenic effects on the fetus this is not a safe drug to be continued in pregnancy so we have to shift the patient on aspirin plus low molecular weight heparin which is the safest drugs available what are the clinical criteria when should we suspect that yes this patient has antiphospholipid antibody syndrome if there is clear cut history of thromboembolic evidence before then directly we can suspect it can be arterial or venous if patient has sle it's an clinical criteria yes she can have if she has three or more abortions less than 10 weeks then again if she has any unexplained fetal loss in second or third trimester suddenly death of the fetus think of apa early onset of severe pih means even before 24 weeks she has pregnancy induced hypertension unexplained think of antiphospholipid antibodies unexplained iugr think of anti antiphospholipid antibodies unexplained thrombosis naturally it indicates towards antiphospholipid antibodies and if on investigation you get biologically false positive syphilis test again please rule out antiphospholipid antibody in that particular patient things to remember antiphospholipid antibodies associated with recurrent pregnancy losses more commonly associated with venous thrombosis and these thrombi can affect all the organs possible in cns there can be thrombosis and leading to ischemia myocardial infarction in heart kidney there can be thrombosis ischemia infarction in lungs it can lead to pulmonary hypertension so if you have a question in which there have they have put these criteria that what a antiphospholipid antibody syndrome patient can have please remember that pulmonary hypertension is very commonly seen because of thrombi getting stuck in the lungs there would be no pancytopenia what goes down is platelet count because platelet aggregation because of thrombosis and it may have hemolytic anemia in 25% of the patient but neutrophil count always remain normal in antiphospholipid antibody syndrome remember this this is very frequently asked question now coming to the other entity other cause of recurrent pregnancy losses which is anatomical cervical incompetence there is painless cervical dilatation in second or early third trimester and what happens the membrane start ballooning out or there is ascending infection and rupture of membrane take place or gradually the patient aborts so this is a consequences of cervical incompetence usually it is seen after 16 weeks to 24 weeks any time gradually as the first abortion if it was 16 weeks the next abortion may be little earlier that is around maybe around 14 15 weeks the next abortion would be much more earlier maybe around 12 13 weeks so this this way the affection goes on increasing how what suggest typical history in past pregnancies that patient was having sudden either membranes were a uh, broken and sudden loss of fluid or she was found she had little pain and she went to the doctor and she, the doctor found that the os is completely open and she is in the stage of abortion so this typical history of painless cervical dilatation suggests us that she may have cervical incompetence if patient is non pregnant then if we can easily pass hagar's number 8 dilator through the internal os it suggests that the cervix is incompetent it's not holding on to the means the os is not really competent 
or if the patient is pregnant right now then you can just do TVS that is transvaginal sonography and if you find that the cervical length is less than 3 cm you can suspect that the effacement has already started and this cervix is not going to really take care of this pregnancy for a long period. The other sign on ultrasound is funneling of the internal os. The internal os starts opening up and membrane start projecting. So these two signs that the decrease in cervical length and funneling of the internal os confirms our suspicion that this patient may have cervical incompetence. How to manage? It's the management is rest. We can give progesterone to such patient. But if it is cervical the incompetence is well proven, then surgical management is the best. And the procedure is cervical encircalage. Now the timing, ideally we can do it at 18-20 weeks. Once we have ruled out anomalies in the fetus by doing anomaly scan, we can proceed for the procedure. But in a patient where there were recurrent losses, we cannot really wait till 18 to 20 weeks because she might abort before that. So we have to do the procedure ideally two weeks prior to her earliest loss. You understand? If her last abortion was at 14 weeks, then you have to do the encircalage even before 14 weeks, two weeks earlier. So we can do it as early as 10 weeks also, if it is indicated in that particular patient. There are two procedures. One is McDonald's and the other one is Schrodinger's. You know, in McDonald's, we have to go at the cervico-vaginal junction as high as possible where the vaginal rugosities end and we have to put in a stitch with non-absorbable suture material which is usually either black silk or proline can be used as high as possible we take bursting sutures four or five bites and tie the knot anteriorly and cut the suture this is mcdonald's method and in shirodkas the material use is mercelin tape in, the, in that procedure, we need a little more dissection because this is more physiological. We try to reach to the internal loss as much as possible. We take a transverse incision at the cervicovaginal fold, separate the tissue from the bladder, push the bladder high up, take a posterior incision and then put a muslin tape all around the cervix as high as possible towards internal loss and the knot is tied posteriorly and then we close these both incisions and preg pregnancy proceeds. McDonald's is easier to perform because less dissection. Shirodkas is more physiological, more effective but lot of dissection and blood loss is more. So depending on the situation and the competency of the surgeon and the experiences they can choose whichever procedure they want. Now we want this pregnancy to continue till 37 weeks of gestation because we all know as the gestation goes on increasing fetal lungs get mature and thus we can avoid respiratory distress syndrome and IVH and NEC that is necrotizing enterocolitis all these things we avoid as we avoid preterm birth so we want to take this pregnancy till minimum 37 completed weeks so once the patient reaches to this gestational age then we take out the stitch Cause now we want her to go for normal labor. We want those changes to take place. Effacement, cervical dilatation, formation of lower segment. So to have all these changes, once she completed 37 weeks, we take out the stitch and let the cervix go through the physiological changes of early labor. If patient lands up in pain before 37 completed weeks, then we have to remove the stitch at that particular time. Because if we don't remove, it may cause annular detachment of the cervix completely. Because it's a non-absorbable suture material and cervix will go on dilating as the contractions will be there. And there would be complete detachment of the cervix. So to avoid that, we cut the stitch if the patient is in labor earlier than 37 weeks. If she doesn't, then we continue till 37 weeks, take out the stitch and let her progress in labor. So things to remember and just to revise in a woman with history of recur recurrent abortion with isolated increase in APTT what is the most likely cause you should always say lupus anticoagulant that is the most common cause found in recurrent abortion and APTT is prolonged PT would be normal 
thrombocytopenia would be there and hemolytic anemia would be there but neutrophil counts will remain normal. Lupus anticoagulant is often identified that. Means you are thinking now that it is lupus. How to confirm? Which is the investigation of choice? That is IOC. It is prolonged APTT. And dilute Russell Viper Venom time is the confirmatory test. So these are the important things. Once you suspect, think of lupus first. If lupus is there, to think on lab diagnosis, prolonged APTT will add. And you want to confirm it, you confirm it with Russell Viper Venom time. If it is prolonged, it confirms that the patient has lupus anticoagulant. Bacteria in discriminated in recurrent abortion. This is a little difficult question that infections. We have seen that torch infection doesn't cause to RPL. Then which are these infection, infections? So bacterial infections and in bacterial infection, Listeria monocytogens is the bacteria incriminated in recurrent abortion. So these are little different points which I want you to remember and this covers recurrent pregnancy losses and the most important points related with the subject. Thank you.